Welcome to How to Write a Novel, the podcast where I tell you about my adventures writing a novel and in doing so, hopefully help us both in our magical quest to be sweet, sweet writers. So let's begin with what I did yesterday, which was not very much. It was actually, I think, the first time writing this book that it's kind of a day of full regression. Or not regression, but a, a regrouping, a re... Uh, what do they call that in the military? Maybe they do call it regrouping. Fall back! Regroup! So as I was discussing yesterday, I was writing this conversation between these two characters, and they're the only two characters of any consequence in the book, and the whole book is just basically conversations between them. So, you know, this shit's gotta be done properly. <laughs> and to me, like, in mostly anything that I write, but particularly in this story, the plot points are just the conversation points. The interpersonal relationship and where it has gotten to is really all that matters. There is other stuff that's going to happen. But the tone and the flow and the point of the whole thing is just these two characters. So, as things stand, we've got Seret, the rhino war orphan, who's stranded on a space station with weird creatures she does not like. And there's a weird creature named Quailum who is her, like, liaison guy. So she doesn't really like this guy. She's tired of him always showing up and trying to fucking talk to her. And, you know, she's not interested in opening up about her experiences to this fucking nerd. <laughs> this alien nerd. So in the previous chapter, she actually went way out of her way to avoid him. Like, she ends up climbing up to this weird part of the station where obviously no one's supposed to be. Kind of up in the rafters type of shit. So that's actually why she's talking to him today. She kind of wanted to show off a little bit. She kind of wanted to be like, hey buddy, I didn't see you yesterday. Where were you? But as the conversation went on, it, uh, it never even got to the point of that coming up. And as I was discussing yesterday, they had this little conversation about what would happen if they got in a fight, you know? Like which species would win? Who would, who would destroy the other? And how Surratt's whole philosophy of her people is to act on instinct and to don't overthink or even think at all. When the, the time for action has come, you better already be acting. That's, that's how you succeed. So that conversation kept going where Quailum, the fucking Xeno anthropologist science guy is like, hey, you know, he's sort of noncommittal, just like, oh, take your word for it, I guess. You know more about it than me. And I had her to get, like, mad at him. Like, don't give me that. Don't act like you're so different, like you live in some different world than me, just because you go to school and just because you surround yourself with this fucking idea of how things are, your little ivory tower world. That doesn't actually change how the real world is. We're both in the real world. We both know how it works. And I'm telling you how it works. And you're just acting like you're placating me. Like, well, maybe. But that whole conversation, I'm like, geez, why is... This is too... She doesn't even want to talk to this guy. Yesterday she avoided him on purpose. And now she won't stop talking to him. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm just like reading it. And I'm like, this is way too... Why would she keep talking to this guy? Even if it is to berate him and his ideas. Because it's still, it's so one-sided. He barely said anything. It's like she's just dying to insult the guy. Which is all kind of true. I mean, it's all sort of appropriate to the place that they're at. But I was thinking like, okay, maybe put that aside. You know, I'll just clip that out. Put it somewhere in a slush folder. Maybe that concept could still come up later. But it doesn't necessarily have to. It feels like it's just kind of kind of over-expressing the same idea. So then I was looking at where, where was I trying to get to with this conversation? So there was the idea of her bragging a little bit that she so completely evaded him the day before. 
Then there was the idea of Qualum acting uncomfortable in the building that they're in because it's a school and he actually didn't like school and he's got a lot of problems with the process of how things work within his own society. Which, looking back, he doesn't actually say. Like, I planted that seed, but that idea hasn't actually come up in the conversation because it immediately veered off into, I bet I could kill you. <laughs> I bet if we fought, I would win. And then I also had an idea that I came in with, or as I was writing about her walking around this alien building, that there are stairs, that the station in general has stairs, but it also has like these big ramps, kind of like big overpasses that Qualum's people, because they're almost like jellyfish, weird squid sort of things, they can kind of jet along those extra fast. And it seems a little more appropriate to their biology. So like, why do they have steps? Are steps really handy for them? Or is this like, so that when other people come to the station, they don't just get completely stymied by a situation that doesn't work. And I thought that could be a little opportunity for uh, Qualum to describe a little more about his species, because that's something that I'm kind of keeping deliberately vague in a way, just because, because Surratt finds them physically repulsive <laughs> because they're these weird aliens. Like she has a hard time focusing even on looking at them, and particularly when she looks at their more fine motor systems of their hands and their feet and their mouths and stuff. Like they've got a mouth hidden under a flap and it's all just like creepy and and I was kind of basing it on like the big granddaddy example is like in HP Lovecraft stuff. How it's a shame in a way that Lovecraft has been so dissected. Like you can go on the Lovecraft wiki and you can see a list of every known cosmic being that he came up with and everything that we know about them. And you can get a little plushy doll of Cthulhu, you know. But in the stories, none of this stuff was described except in passing brief sketches because it terrified people to look at it. Like it's one of those things you can only do in writing, really is that the very notion of contemplating these ideas makes people lose their minds so they can't look too close and they can't describe it too closely. So this is a very toned down version of that. It's just that she just doesn't like it. It's just uncomfortable to stare at this alien guy's hand and try to figure out if it's a hand or if it's tentacles formed together to be a hand or what. It just kind of seems blurry and indistinct in her mind, and she just doesn't want to look at it. So she doesn't, <laughs> yeah. And it's one of those things that if there ever was a movie or something someday, some guy in the design department's got a lot of work to do, <laughs> a lot of shit to figure out. But the nice thing about writing a novel is that I don't have to describe it, and it's kind of better if I don't. It's better to leave things ambiguous, because the best way to make things feel weird and alien is for them to be not fully comprehensible. But I thought this might be a good time for her to ask him about the nature of their feet and how their feet work. And then also I was going to have her talk about how while she was up in the rafters of this station looking down at people all day, she noticed this thing about how the Nadarian they're called, that's Qualum's race, the like jellyfish people, they're basically blue, but their colors can change. And she notices while watching them throughout the day that their colors shift throughout the day, but also in almost like a, a rainbow pattern, like a gradual shift. Like over on this end of the station, everyone is more white colored. And over on that end of the station, everyone's more purple. And then the gradient in between. And she wonders if they even know that they're doing that if they've ever seen it from above, or if they're just reacting to the people in their immediate vicinity. And the overall effect is this gradient. So that one in particular, I can definitely shelve for later. She can bring that up at any point. It's not important that that happened now. And as for the other ones, it's just like this conversation is splitting off in enough different directions that it's just, 
it's almost like in my own brain, like that thing I just described about it's hard to stare at something directly. And your brain just blurs out and can't focus. That's how I feel looking at this chapter where I've got, it's pretty long at this point, so I've got all this text and then the bottom of it is just tons of dashes and, you know, haphazardly written paragraphs of the different ideas. And it just looks like such a mess at the bottom of this page. And even just scrolling down, because there's so much that's done, quote-unquote, first draft done, I gotta scroll down past all this stuff to just get to a mess at the bottom where I don't know what I'm trying to say anymore. I don't know where I'm trying to get to. And I was sitting on a bus last night. The sun had gone down because this time of year in Canada, it gets dark early. It was only like 6.30 at night, but it was pitch black. And I'm just trying to focus on this thing. I was just like, fuck this, man. <laughs> you know, Fuck this, I hate looking at this. How did this get so tangled up? Why is this so complicated? Because I really did just go in with the notion of, let's just have her gloat about her hiding skills without saying it directly. And then I was like, oh, she should mention though the, the rainbow colors, which is also not an idea that I had had until writing the chapter before that, when I was just like, that would be cool, just came up with that. And then I came up with this and that and all this other stuff. Like I was just gonna let the conversation go wherever, but it went too many places. So this is where it's timed now. What I did yesterday, instead of actual work, I just like manually retracted things or re-sorted things so that today they'll be easier to deal with. Basically, I took all of those weird random notes at the bottom of the page, copied those and put them in their own document as like a backup. So I don't need to worry about fucking around with them or deleting them or rearranging them. I can do whatever I want with them just to know that if if I delete something and then I later decide that I actually do like it, I've still got it. It's over in this little side file. Then I took the chapter, it's chapter 12, and I split it in half. So now it's 12A, which is a, the great big chunk that's fine, that's all, that's good. And 12B is just the last couple of paragraphs plus all those notes. So it just takes a lot of the pressure of my confusion off of this particular point in the story because I don't have to worry about the first half, 12A, that's fine. Just leave that alone, don't even look at it. So now when I open the file, I can just immediately see in 12B, okay, here's just a couple little back and forths of dialogue and then here's all those notes that I gotta figure out. And those notes are safely copied somewhere else so I don't have to hesitate about ripping them apart in this particular part of the chapter. And really, I guess I'm kind of leaning toward just scrapping everything and just cutting this chapter short. Because I do think that that feeling I had when Surat just kept talking about the philosophy between the two, the differences, and how she just wouldn't let it go, and how it felt like she shouldn't be talking anymore, she should be done with talking. That seems like the real, most true feeling of what's happening in this scene. She's already talked to him more than she's ever talked to him before. And I mean, I do plan for her to eventually warm to him, because even though she doesn't really like him, doesn't really like his people, doesn't really like what he represents even, just the fact that he is mandated to have to talk to her, basically. If she wants to talk to him every day, he can't say no. It's his job to talk to her. So she's gonna come to lean on that somewhat, just because there is no one else to talk to. Another little side aspect is that she's not the only rhino person, not the only Therium on this station. 
but the therium all very distinctly avoid each other just because they're all survivors of this cataclysm where their planet was destroyed and basically they just because they're these tough ass rhino people they can put on a show and they can pretend to be doing all right and they can pretend to still be noble and self-sufficient while they're on their own while they're just a weird visitor on a weird station but if they see each other if they hang out with each other if they talk to each other they also don't want to be liars they don't want to be deniers of reality or deniers of what they think of as the truth and there's just no denying the truth of the fact that they all came from a destroyed world like they they wouldn't be able to hang out and talk to each other without facing up to something that none of them want to or are even remotely ready to face up to. So I haven't had Surat admit this yet, but that's why she won't talk to them. So she has no one to talk to except this fucking weird alien scientist kid. But that sort of relationship needs to build way, way slower. So that's what I'm leaning toward now, is like today when I go open up this file, and it'll just seem like a much smaller thing. It's just, it's not this big wall of text with a tangle of ideas at the bottom. It's just a little bit. It's just a couple paragraphs of dialogue and then these ideas. And I'm leaning heavily toward just shuttering them all. And if I can find places for them, for these ideas to come up later in other conversations, great. And if not, then that's fine too. But there's no more unnatural a conversation than just hitting bullet points. Like, hey, let's talk about this. Okay, now let's talk about this. Okay, now let's talk about this. <laughs> you know? I mean, sometimes you meet people like that in real life even, that it's like they've got their fucking itinerary. Here's the docket. Here's all the things I want to talk about. And they're always steering the conversation toward the things that they want to talk about. And it's fucking weird and unpleasant. And if that's how either of these aliens were, then so be it. But that is not my intention even though they're both severe personality types in their own ways, that's not how either of them are intended to be. None of them are, neither of them are supposed to be just oblivious to social cues. They have different social cues. They have different ways of talking and different ways of discussing things. But I don't want either of them to just... I mean, because it's just boring. Like, dialogue is my favorite part of a story. It's the most interesting part. So it's like a sin to make that part not interesting, you know? To make dialogue rote and mechanical and expository. It's death, man. <laughs> it's just like so awful. I don't, I'm not gonna let that happen. That will not happen. So maybe what I'll do is of these like four or five different branches that this conversation could take, maybe I'll just pick one. I mean, really, I'll just have to see. I won't know till tomorrow. I won't know till I sit down and just spend some time feeling out these, this, these different options. But that's, uh, that's what I'm leaning toward now. Maybe, actually, here's an idea. Maybe Quaylum, the jelly boy, is so uncomfortable in this building that he leaves, you know? Maybe she's actually kind of ready. She's like, she's got all these fucking topics loaded up in her brain. Like, let's talk about all this shit that I got on my mind. And he doesn't want to stay. It's like the first time that he's the one who wants to leave. That's a good idea. That's what I'm gonna do. That's almost certainly what I'm gonna do. Hey, see, that's a bonus too to this podcast. Maybe this will actually help me move forward with this book. I won't just be describing what I did yesterday. It'll help me figure out what I'm doing tomorrow. So that's where I am with this story, and uh, I guess I kind of want to describe how, mechanically, how I'm writing this story and how I'm putting it together. Because I've tried many different styles of techniques over the years, and many people have many different recommendations. But I'll tell you how things are going for this book, and uh, why they seem to be working for me and why I believe they will based on past experiences because I do think the mechanical side of writing of the discipline of writing is very important 
if you're going to sit down and do something each day, you can't just wing it every day. Like, oh, I guess I'll just sit down and write every day and see what happens. Like, that's, it's, I think it's much better to give yourself more of a sense of security, more of a sense of a safety net. Like, things can only go so wrong or so awry because you've got plans and backup strategies and ways that things are going to work. Because that'll also just help you actually do the writing every day, to just actually sit down to, so that it feels like a fun thing to do. Because no matter how fun it seems, to do it every single day, to sit down and write every single day, it's still always going to be hard, it's always going to be a struggle. So to help make yourself more comfortable, you need to be comfortable with yourself, basically. You need to know that you've put yourself in good hands, and that you are those good hands, and that, that you have enough of a mechanical plan for how you're going to get to the end of the book that you have faith that you will get to the end of the book that you won't stall out halfway through and just be hopelessly lost <sighs> god why do i <laughs> i keep recording these on the same like mountain trail and i'm just dying holy shit you're not supposed to podcast while you walk up a mountain you're just not supposed to Okay, I'm actually I'm going to do a little bit of editing because uh, I got off on a whole side rant today that really makes this episode long and doesn't necessarily need to be part of this particular conversation because when uh, describing taking notes for this story, I started talking about the origin of the story and what gave me the idea for writing about a xenophobic literal alien and uh, I mean long story short it's basically just from my own experiences of culture shock and what it felt like and I'm like I want to examine that more I want to take that feeling and use it as a guidepost as a guiding light toward writing a story but I really got off on a ramble and uh, it's really long so I'm gonna snip those parts out and uh, I'll put them in tomorrow. So come back tomorrow to hear about what a terrible person I am and how, uh, <laughs> how much trouble I have integrating with societies outside of Canada. So I started taking notes right away, I think while I was still in Amsterdam. And then over the course of the next year, I just took notes. Took notes whenever I thought of them. Just had a big slush file, just this one text file with just every little thought that I had. And uh, like I mentioned, it started with a human on an alien space station, and then it quickly became an alien on a different alien space station. And like, let's just take that feeling, that seed of that feeling, and ramp it up and really try to create a little diorama, you know? <laughs> a little puzzle box people can peer into that examines this feeling and where it comes from and what it means and what's to be done <laughs> about this horrifying xenophobia. So over the course of the year I was kind of working on other things and I would just take notes, you know, for whatever stories I was thinking of, but this one really I did just keep coming back to again and again where I would think about what it was like to, to travel and then how it felt now to be back home again after that and even the slightly more subtle aspects of like Toronto versus Vancouver or the east coast of Canada and just Montreal even how the different places feel different but that was all subtle much more subtle than going to a whole different country so I just put those all together in a big slush file and then uh, it came came time for winter so it's like okay I'm gonna go to Vancouver for the winter and I'm gonna write a book while I'm there. This is like the plan because I'd done something similar with the nonfiction book that I wrote that's about the video game The Last of Us. It was similar to this technique where just the picking away at it day after day working on it every day but it was more of an experiment to see how this works for me and how this feels. I didn't stick to it as rigidly as I have this time. 
And I was surprised that whole time of how slow things were going. But it taught me that that's just how things go for me. Like this time I'm much more prepared for the pace and the slowness of this. Because now I know that that's just how I work. But I was like, all right, I'm moving out west for the winter. I managed to write a nonfiction book. Now I'm writing a novel. I'm doing it. So which one's it going to be? And as I went through all my stuff, I'm like, this is the one, man. This is the one. I've got so many ideas for this book, and they're mostly arguments. It's like I'm trying to uh, sort things out in my own mind of just like, still, I'm still shocked and disappointed that I did feel so uncomfortable with traveling. But okay, to get to the notes in particular about this story. The story is called Explode, by the way. Stylized with dashes in between each letter, like the classic poster for the anime Akira. Neo Tokyo is about to explode, and then one of the chapters of Scott Pilgrim used it too. E X P L O D E. So I took the big file I had been adding to for a year, and I went through and just copy and pasted each each idea into its own file so it wasn't just one big mass anymore and then I organized those by topic so I've got coping with loss and acclimating to surroundings so that's early in the book uh, just a folder for just moments on the space station just little beautiful moments that happened because that made me think of uh, while I was in uh, Amsterdam, there's this park near Slaughterdick Station, I think it's called. It sounds like Slaughterdick, but it's got J's in it and stuff. Really beautiful, and I really liked going there. I went there pretty much every day just to be in a park and just to feel normal again. Right now, I'm walking on a rocky beach. I'm big into the outdoors, man. I don't like being inside very much and uh yeah i just remember like that that park was really beautiful and there was even this this one little moment where i was just sitting on a, like a fallen log and i was typing something into my phone and i remember this mother went by with her daughter and just smiled at me <laughs> and and i was like huh tiniest little moment but i felt totally like i was back home because in canada you just smile at each other you say hi in Vancouver, you thank the bus driver <laughs> when you get off, you know? Even if you get off the back doors, you're like, thank you! And just that little, that little moment I always remembered. So I have a folder of just similar things like that. Like, even though this character is having this tough time while her brain is unraveling and falling apart on this weird station, it's not all bad. There's going to be a lot of little beautiful moments of like, wow, this is crazy. I can't believe I got to see this. I can't believe that I'm here. Then by far, the biggest folder is, it's called Evie and Abe Argue, because originally Surat's name was Evie, and I don't remember why. I had a reason. And Abe was short for Alien Boy. <laughs> it's just this code name, because to transliterate something, you know, what's that called? A uh, Like to make a compound word like that out of an English phrase would obviously not work for aliens. So anyway, the little conversation stems and ideas that these two characters could argue about, that one's huge. There's a ton of files in that. There's like 53 different items in that one and I've already used some. Then there's a section for computer access, because I'm eventually going to have it be that the, uh, the Nadari and the jellyfish people will eventually give Surat access to their computer system, just so she can like watch movies and look up stuff or whatever, but they've never let someone who's not of their species use their computer before, and their computer is semi-biological. They're not fully in control of it, it's a little bit in control of itself. They're not even sure if she'll be able to uh, interface with it, but it's going to turn out that she can interface with it 
way, way better than them. So she's gonna secretly start fucking with shit without them knowing. Then a folder for the climactic finale, which based on the name of the book, which I will remind you is Explode, you might be able to guess what that might entail. Then two items in the folder marked final scene and two in outtake ideas. Oh, maybe see if the outtakes have the name idea. No, it does not. The outtake idea was that beyond being a rhino-ish creature, what if she could set herself on fire? Like really play up the fire versus water aspect. I was even thinking of having the squid ship kind of be semi-aquatic inside. There's a tiny bit of that idea still in there. But yeah, like what if she could ignite herself, but not while she's there because the water environment doesn't allow that? But that's just weird. <laughs> that's just weird on a level that is unnecessary for this story. And physiologically, I don't know if any of that would make any sense. So once I had all those pieces split up like that, then I just started writing straight through. Because that's something I've done before and it hasn't worked. But that's when I, if I just start from scratch and just start writing in a straight line, eventually I get lost and I get confused and I don't know what's happening. So what I did this time is, all right, chapter one. And then I went through all of those little notes and I picked out all the ones that might be appropriate to this chapter and put them in that folder. Read them over, think about them, then start writing without using those notes, just start writing. And then if I get stuck or I get lost, I can go refer to those notes and see if there's something in there that'll spur me on. And then after I was done the chapter, I'd go back and read through those notes and see if there's anything I meant to put in that I missed and then see if I can add that in. And then if there's any note files in there that never got used, then those get returned back to their appropriate filing system for future use. And it's been really cool because most of the book is still just written as I go each moment to moment, especially going slow like I do each day, like, okay, what's the next beat? What's the next beat? But I've always got that pool to draw from of these specific notes that seem like they'll be appropriate to that specific chapter. And if not that, then I can go back even another step and go through the whole big mass and see if there's something in there that'll save me. And even if there isn't, even just going through that process, that's something I'll definitely talk about later, is that I never really have a problem with writer's block, partially because I either just stop, you know, if I have writer's block that day, I just stop until tomorrow but also just to have something mechanically to fall back on. If I'm a little stuck, just the act of going through those notes and then digging through the larger pool of notes and just letting your mind idle a little bit or even reading notes for parts that are gonna happen later, parts that aren't appropriate now something is going to connect, something is going to spur a thought. And it's just a good feeling to have that net, that net of ideas that I came up with before I started. So you're not just like, cause it's, it, it does feel like working without a net when you're just writing, you're just writing and you're like, I better not fall off. Cause if I do, there's nothing where having that slush file of the ideas, like, yeah, if I get stuck, if I need a little break, if I'm feeling uncomfortable or feeling nervous about something or whatever, to just take whatever, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, just to, just to drift through the different directories and just to drift through the different files, just to know that it's there for you. It's like, if I get stuck, past me already wrote, let's see, let's do a little check of how many files I got in here. Past me wrote 251 little things, little miscellaneous ideas already. 
something in there has got to be worth something. And I also think it's quite important to have quite a strong grasp on what the ending is going to be before you start. I think it can definitely change, but that story that I mentioned in episode zero when I said uh, I used to write a serial every week and I didn't have a sense of the ending of that and it got so off track I'll talk about it later for sure because it got so off track where the whole tone of the story changed halfway through and then I didn't know where it was going so I just started introducing new characters and like it just fell the fuck apart because I didn't have an end to get toward so like this idea that I spent a year gathering notes I don't think that's any kind of hard and fast rule. Maybe a year, maybe two years, whatever. Maybe a month, maybe a week of just hardcore note taking. I think you'll know in your soul, in your heart of hearts, when you've got enough material to feel comfortable, like enough. It's like your own little encyclopedia. Like if I get stuck on this story and I need to know something about it or I need to go get some information, You'll know for yourself when you have enough, but I think you don't have enough if you don't know how it's going to end. You've got to at least know more or less how this story is going to end. Because uh, I know famously Stephen King doesn't have endings in mind when he writes, but I feel like you can fucking tell, <laughs> you know? I don't want to shit on Stephen King because he's written some of the greatest things ever. Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption. Not only an amazing movie, one of the best stories ever written. So fucking good. And his big sprawling epics like The Stand, amazing. But The Stand doesn't have a good ending. You know, his stories never have a fucking good ending. <laughs> you can count on one hand how many stories of his have a good ending. Misery, Shawshank, The End, is that it? You know, <laughs> like I don't know, very few. So don't do that, have an ending. like. There's obviously a lot to be said for letting things be open and free and writing as you go. I'll talk about that later too, because that's definitely something I've come around on. I used to, I think because not having a direction went so poorly in that one story, I went the other way and I tried to have too much planning and it, it was kind of constrictive. I think it's very good to be open. Like already this story of the alien space station has gone all kinds of weird places that my notes never could have dreamed of. They'd have no idea. But I, I just, I think it's so important to have that shining beacon in the distance that no matter how lost in the woods you get, you know that that's where you're trying to get to. And the ending is so important, you know? Like if you have a great story with a lame ending, it's very hard for that to stick in in someone's mind. But if you have a kind of lame story with an amazing ending, you're gold. That's good. <laughs> that, it's, it's worth so much. I think of like uh, the Telltale Walking Dead adventure games. Season one in particular. I had so many problems with it. So many problems, so many parts where I'm like, this sucks. I am not feeling this at all. <laughs> but the ending is so good and so perfect that that will always be a classic game. The Walking Dead Season 1. The Telltale game, not the fucking TV show. Just one of the greatest endings in video game history. And it just makes the rest not matter. It's like, alright, the rest was a pretty fucking half-baked. But it got us there, so I'll take it. But to reiterate basically what I was trying to say about process is yeah this is how I did it for this book and it really seemed to work take notes take as many notes as you can every little stray idea that you have while you're in the shower while you're walking to the coffee shop for as long as you need to until you have I mean a few dozen at least just little ideas little ends little moments make sure you have a relatively strong conception of an ending maybe you'll come up with a better stronger ending as you go but have an ending that's good enough, that you're like, all right, that'll do, pig. That'll be pretty good. Then sort those notes into thematic and, if possible, chronological order. And use them to guide you as you write at a very slow, methodical pace. 
day by day, chip by chip, until you make it through. And if you get stuck, like I did today, revert, you know? Take what you've got and break it down again. Break it back into what it used to be. Take it back a step. Take these ideas, sort them out again, look at them, get a new perspective, keep moving. You know, even if you're not writing, even if you're actually taking things out, you're still moving. The process of movement is still happening because you're still working with the story, even if it's to break it back down into its component pieces so that you can try again. If travel is searching and home what's been